merch. This clip is brought to you by BattleOnline.com. Peace, family. You see, boy finds a new tribe representing for BattleOnline.com. This week, we're joined with an exclusive special guest, and it is the man himself, Young Bleed Collyon. What's good with you, Kevin? Man, definitely a pleasure to have you join us on the platform. Oh man, it's a um, it's definitely an honor and a pleasure, man. From um, here the way out there in London, England, where you at, man? It's a beautiful thing. I appreciate y'all. Indeed. Much love, and we know not just that here in the UK, you've definitely gotten a mass of fans worldwide. We put the word out and said that we got to have you on it. There was definitely a huge array of support, and we've got some fan questions which we got to get to later and stuff like that, but. You know, we usually start off with definitely taking it from, I guess, the beginning. We can see from like your bio and stuff, it says that you were rapping at age of nine years old and stuff and grew up in South Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So, I mean, you can obviously explain it a lot better for the benefit of our audience. Just what it was like for you coming up and how you got some of your early starts and just writing at that young of an age. Yeah, man, just for a quick briefing, man, you know, I tell everybody, man, I'm about old as hip hop nine days. And um, I'm born this way, man. Uh, my mother actually read me um, Dr. Seuss, and I was still in the embryo. And about eight months to a year, once I was born, I was able to read Dr. Seuss. I had an uncle that taught me drums, like um, congas and bongas and a whole set by the time I was about five years old. So I was musically inclined, raised. You know, when they say rap is rhythm and poetry, you know, that's your rhythm and poetry. My uncle and my mother. But everybody else, um, my grandparents, you know, um, parents, just just in general, my pop, step pop, it was just, you know, all that music background was there. My granddaddy played blues on the piano. Another, another one of my uncles played blues. My grandmother was um, president of the quiet Sweet Home Baptist Church in South Baton Rouge. Um, so I was heavenly music, um, musically influenced. Before I was 10, I was in the opera called Carmen. Me and one of my um, street brothers out here by the name of Chris Miller, we was real young. We sung soprano, we real young. You know, the only two black guys that were in um, this particular um, opera. So all those elements was there. And, you know, as hip hop was evolving, I was evolving and, and to a young boy and eventually to a young man. So I found my glitch somewhere around 82, 83. And it's like, that's it. That's what I'm, you know, that's going to be my music channel, basically. And somewhere, you know, along the lines um, of the fourth grade, we used to have a poetry teacher that visited our classroom at least for an hour or so a week. And um, she was teaching us, you know, um, the differential between different poems. And my favorite of the poems was the haiku poems, like three lines or something like that, real simple, get to the point, rhyme one time and then conclude it. So I learned those writing elements from my poetry teacher. And of course, my mother and aunts and um, uncles that wrote a lot of poetry and stuff like that. So all those combined elements um, made me who I am today, man. Just for a quick briefing, you know what I mean, to start. Okay. No, that's pretty dope and stuff. And um, it's definitely been documented that even when you was in high school, you were selling CDs and stuff to students. You know, you were stocking your products in mom and pop stores and stuff like that. But even prior to this, at the age of 11, it says you was trusted the car keys of one of the most respected people in the neighborhood and he was given access to a local recording studio, which is where you laid down some of your first rap. So do you want to speak about that? Yeah, um, really my pops was starter, um, starter, my step pops, really, you know what I mean? Um, Emmanuel Allen, you know, um, he started to teach me to drive real young, about 10 or so like that. So, you know, I, I, I do his errands and different things like that since a kid as well as a few other OGs in the neighborhood that, you know, I was that type of kid. Everybody knew me, what my mission was, and um, streetwise and otherwise, just in support of each other. I had access to a whole lot of extra things that the average kid probably didn't, depending on, you know, the family grew up in, the environment, the neighborhood. Um, Something else you asked me after that, man, uh, I'm trying to remember. What was the rest of the question? It was just based around, I guess, um, you know, you getting access to a studio at such a young age and being able to lay down some early recordings. Yeah, shots off to him and rest in peace to Tommy Jefferson. Tommy Jefferson was um, old. The cat, he had to be in his 30s, maybe 40s or something at the time. When I was 11, man, shots off to my homeboy, Black, man, from the 16th, 17th Street Projects in the top of South Baton Rouge. And, um, 
my grandmother and older cousins, female cousin, um, and just finding them lived on both sides of those projects. Um, my grandmother moved out of the bottom into the top, so I kind of I tell the guys in my neighborhood I grew up twice or three times. You know, slash the bottom into the south, and eventually, you know, G Lane the east side for his residing. But my man Black, you know, you see me freestyling the project, you know, in the breeze way and on the steps and just walking through. I used to tell my cousin, hey man, you know, uh, your cousin got a little something. Now I know a studio he can go into. You know, I didn't know where to record in Baton Rouge. So my uncle and them uh, played in bands and, and, and festivals in the town. But they play live music and different things like that. So I had to come up when I came up. I, um, I had the same but different evolution for his um, studio record. Tommy Jefferson was one of the guys that my man turned me young to out in the Glen Oaks area and uh, told me where to go and start recording for somewhere around 11 years old. My mom took me to, to and paid the first $20 ever and pretty much the rest is history for my record. So like I said, right in that nine. I started to actually do recording demo tapes and things like that about 11 years old. Shout out to Black on the show. Wow. I don't suppose you still have um, any of those recorders around? Um, a few of my homeboys, man. I spent my life trying to preserve everything, but I done moved so much. You know, I lived in 41 states at least a weekend. So over time, man, I done lost a lot of shit. You know what I mean? Different things. A lot of people got hidden treasures they don't know. You know, yeah. storages and all kind of shit, man, over time. So it was King Touch Tune with me, man. Some of that stuff my mother um, may still have, but from 11 on up, yeah, man, it's been a hell of a journey. So, yeah, hopefully in time, a few of them may pop up. You know? Okay, I can respect that. I mean, before we move forward, I want to still slightly stay backwards a little bit just to ask, um, because I think it's important before the next question, what sort of influences did you have early within music and stuff like, I guess, artists that maybe attracted your ear and stuff and you were uh, like the way that they moved and, you know, really probably motivated you were inspired? Was there any local artists from Baton Rouge and stuff or was it, you know, wider artists from around? Um, here again, my family for starters, <clears throat> right off the, um, right off the tree weird. Then, of course, um, a guy that, my guys that was, you know, was a neighborhood gang and some family family members called the Wrecking Crew. Um, Silver Slim, Joker Pete was the OG that was really rapping and making records in my neighborhood. You see what I'm saying? Rest in peace to my cousin Walter, uh, Walter T. And, uh, you know, and just that, that whole, you know, that whole um, environment for us, our evolution in hip hop, for us, what my neighbor was doing. Those were the first guys that was making records, 12 inches, stuff like that. That was the print. And later on, like you said, I would come along and um, that's out to Michael B. Williams, Paul Sterling, the Sterling family. And they'd give me an um, opportunity at about 14, or well, really about 15, 15, 16 years of going into that um, and release my first tape. It was a tape called Much Love. On the flip side, a song called When Dirty Harry Me Sad. It was a top killing song. And, and here again, shouts out to Ernest and Nice Prince and everybody at WXOK Radio, man. It was the first guys when I was that young to play my music on the radio, you know what I mean? We are getting the sake of support and pushing me to the platform for years. Um, yeah, long living. Okay. Because, I mean, you spoke about having just like, I guess, grown-up experiences from young that some may have not necessarily been that privy to. Another grown-up experience yeah. you had was becoming a father at the age of 17. And amidst oh, that, yeah. you chose to drop out of high school during the senior year because, you know, you was juggling a lot of stuff from managing to provide for your family to um, selling you music and CDs. You didn't necessarily want to get caught up in the whole street thing, but you knew music was a way that you wanted to take things going forward. After that, you yeah. formed a group, the concentration camp. And, you know, I want to get into how some of that started coming together and you hooking up and forming that group. Okay, um, pretty much that, man. Um, uh, like you said, I was a young teenage dad, man. Um, uh, at seventeen, you know what I mean. Seventeen years old was official. My son just a firstborn son. He just turned thirty-one, actually a few days back. You know, December ninth. Um, Congrats. so with me trying to push that and still pursue that as a kid, with New um Louisiana not being New York or California, and you know it's um our um. How would you say that? Um, our motto is like, um, it's called a dream state. Louisiana is called a dream state. And so, 
my life along, along the way. You know, that's all you're going to have to pursue if you don't, you know what I mean? Take different things serious and put some action behind your dream theory, you know what I mean? On um, your thought process. So, um, I eventually started looking in those directions, of course, but didn't have access to them. But later in life, that'll come. But um, I didn't want to spend, um, how can I put this, man? Um, well, I can't really say I kind of had to evolve into what it was coming from where I came from. But kind of um, X that out your mind and still keep focused on the dream and keep on um, pushing the pursuit in that sense of the word. So, um, wow, a lot come to mind when you say that, man. Um, in conclusion, the, the, the last end of your question, I want to answer that right that, that you were saying. With this. And, uh, yeah, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the depth of the context. You know. Yes, sir. Yeah, the last part we was just we was the last part we was just um how you kind of got into forming the concentration camp with C Moke and Max Benelli and the rest of the the rest of the gang. Okay. Okay, you got me. Um that part. Yeah, man, um later in life, of course, minus the trains and what have we had city buses and you know, different access to cars and, and the homies and stuff like that. So everybody had the back room studio eventually. And um uh, I would meet a guy by the name of Max Benelli, which was called you know, um, he had a different rap name at the time, but he was about 11 years old. And shout so out to his family, um, and my family, and I was three family for that matter that connected us when he was, um, I was that, that young teenage father, about 17, he was 11 growing. And, um, we had like a two year phone relationship where he saw him in real life. About 13, he started to come back over here to his family in the city. My people took me to see him. And um, we started to mark like we always did. And eventually, years later, he developed a crew called Lalo. That consisted of the numbers on J. Vaughn and Happy Perez. You know what I mean? So we had spent a lot of time at our, our, our parents' house recording demo tapes and different things like that. And I had always, I didn't start solo as a kid. Shout out to my brother, Darian Williams. My, was my street brother, Darian Williams. Um, but we was now we was trying to emulate Ron D on the seat. You know what I'm saying? So, but I kept going with it, and uh, we, he kind of um, left the rap alone. We still friends and brothers to this day. But he had a different route. I had a same but different route. So fast forward the tape up the guy was looking for guys mm -hmm. to continue that type of uh, for that that legacy for that matter. And Max was one of the first, as well as my brother Lucky Knuckles. Um, uh, the street brother, 211, and just different guys in the neighborhood that I spent time. I had turntables and stuff like that in the back room, DJs in the neighborhood. So I spent a lot of time hooking up and experimenting in the back room just trying to develop a sound and a style. So anybody that was around me, you know, I tried to make a part of that. And eventually, um, Fish the Water, Mac Manella was one of those guys that came along that was doing what he was doing. So the young guy perspective reminded me a lot of myself being so young and here again. 9, 11 years old, and I would meet him at 11, so okay, I was interested to see his um, involved, I mean, evolution in that sense. So, once we got together here again, fast forward the tape, and we were coming to certain things, and me and the guy, um, CeeLo, had been home, you know what I mean, on mama since kids, they, they, they went to school together before we was born, so later on, naturally in life, we didn't go to the same elementary school, we went to the same elementary, uh, same, excuse me, middle school. And, you know, rumor, you know, not really rumor. We started to try to formulate a, a rap group. No particular name. I think his name was DJ Ace or something at the time. He was inspired to be a DJ. And I still was on my, my, my rap travel. So uh, it was rumored in that sense around the school for the public, but just, you know, from the heart and mouth. He was my DJ, but we never really did talent shows. We never made a demo tape. We never did nothing. It was just known around the school. I used to beatbox out on pop lock and break dance type of thing, you know what I mean? And the comments area at lunchtime. But we never evolved at that time into a group. So fast forward to take from middle school to somewhere around 93, 94. I had already put my tape out in the street corner. We'll see each other in the neighborhood. And he wasn't really, you know, I guess behind the scenes trying to redevelop all his musical career. And we would link around that time. He comes to one of my houses in the, in the hood. And actually, I still make a music. Of course, we started to work. I, I, 
I come in like at the end of uh, his solo debut for the world, Who's Gonna Ride, and started to help out on a few records. Both wrote a song on now, um, the Never Say Die song. I both wrote No Mercy. I did a hook in, and the rest of the record was pretty much complete. But that would re-involve me and his circle of um, friends and family, and the rest of the city and the radio station. So as all that was happening, Maxim was still around, and I was continuing to run into other rap guys throughout the city and females alike. And eventually as the record label was evolving, um we was working as a click of lace. I said we need a um an overall name that, that signifies all. Like I said, I didn't start so much, but I always thought I'm a Gemini I think at least twice or better, you know, the great modern chapter. So in that sense, um for as hip hop Coming back to New York, uh, sort of say in that sense, uh, click and lace and development, you know, a lot of people had, yeah, kind of um, regime type of titles and stuff like that. Wu-Tang, it was kind of like a Southern Wu-Tang, where it wasn't about one man, one mic, the two MCs and the DJ, you see what I'm saying? Uh, you go back to the Cold Crush, you know what I mean? And 05 MC, we more like, not when I mention all uh, in comparison to Wu Tang, you know, nine or ten guys that was rap. So to make rappers like that, it's easy to do it to get some six things. But me being kind of a hip hop connoisseur, kind of um, I follow a pattern that I call no guidelines, just involved with the music, but, you know, however it starts. And as that that um started to come together, everybody brought something to the table. And I said we need a one name the, the one name, a name pretty much to solidify us all. So I went back to my whole thought process of what this meant to me right before we got to the big time. And keep in mind, I didn't start off at nine years old with the name Young Glee. But I was always in that sense because that was my, my granddad, my grandfather's name, um, Good Glee. So before he was passed, uh, by the time I was 10 years old, I shared with him throughout life one day that I wanted to be a rapper once I got that glitch at eight, nine. I'm going to be a rapper one day, Papa, and I'm going to own me uh, a record company. We used to watch Richie Rich the cartoon a lot. You know what I mean? It's like I said, I want to have, you know, stuff okay. like that. He said, you can get it if you learn to do one thing. You know, keep in mind, my grandfather went blind along the way. His mother went blind, my great-grandmother. So I was in one sense the CNI dog. I was always with him, or at least when I was there for the weekend and summers and sometime in, um, the breaking up of my mother and father, you know, we was kind of, you know, slash grandparents raised, you know, both for the granny and my grandparents too, and all that. But, um, so I thought back to what it, with all this meant to me, everything we're talking about now, and this time is for the money. And once I grow into this name and the world know this name, I can never take it back. I mean, you can, you can switch it up, but you're confused with the, 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 um, the population of the people. So, I, I changed my name one one last time to Young Bleed, and that's a whole different story. But in reference to that, my granddaddy was a World War II veteran. You know, in the Hitler War. I'm born on B-Day. You see what I'm saying? My birthday is June 6, 1974. Um, so um, in, in elementary school, you know, I was always interested in the diary of Anne Frank and things of that nature. Didn't know what I was studying and involving it to. So by the time I grew into a man and I look back at what it all meant, the whole story of the concentration camp in one sense is my life. You see what I'm saying? Um, my nickname is Tank from the neighborhood, from the family street. And my grandfather told my mother when she was pregnant with me that her stomach reminded him of one of them Abrams army tanks when he was in that war. So he said, if you have a little boy, that's what I'm a name before I was here. I was nine. I had a nickname before I had a real name. Junior after my father. But later in life, you know, chip off the old block, you know what I mean? The alpha don't fall uh, too far from the tree. I took all that and marked it into Young Bleed and um, shots out to my brother Robert Butler, man, uh, one of my um, lifetime true friends and OG brothers in the street. We worked at uh, a piece of her joint, a several piece of her. I talked to James and, you know, all the guys before me, my, my, my friend's father, that was a manager that would give us jobs out of high school. If I was paying child support with a case, I'd go over there and do what I had to do. But 
his young exec, which was the guy that was, you know, a year or two older than me that managed the building. And in that break time, you know, they'll let me do what I have to do. If I had talent shows, I need to go right in the back. My homeboys held me down. I could do whatever I needed to do, hustle in and out of pizza hut and you talk about these things now. And um eventually um I was on the lunch break one day and my, my partner um Robert Buzzer, who got in town for short, come to me. He, he was managing, I was working doing a closing for him. He said, Man, I always read the mafia books. I was really interested in the mob and I like the story and different things like that. So I used to read this Gambino or uh, mob book or what have. And he come to me and say, Man, you look like um Don Carleon sitting over here eating a piece of reading this these, these mafia books. So it clicked with me then. So I added the Carly on for my partner, the Young Bleed, and just made it a whole first, middle, last name, like, like little legacy thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. And eventually we passed all that on to the home as far as the idea for a name. Low owned the label, it gave us a place um, to nourish the mark into what we would become. So I just took that whole evolution of myself first, the wall of my granddaddy and said it, you know, we more like um, on a concentration camp of meditating monk that, that's kind of like a purgatory. You know, a lot of us died, murdered, went to jail. So the rap thing was like a breeze that kind of preserved it, took us off the street and all the other different conflicts in life that we could kind of pray, meditate, and focus on a better future. So that was my whole evolution um, for it. Starting the idea of the concentration camp, you know what I mean? Just having an overall unlimited population name that we continued to get other members from other states. It wasn't just about our neighborhood, it wasn't just about me, it wasn't just about low. Shout out to me, time. Um, to where we could have an open door that was empty. So, me looking at the earth being our church in that sense, um, I really looked at the logo of Doug C in the Mad Circle. Rest in peace to put on praise to me. Shout out to Doug C. Um, and, and that whole, yeah, that, exactly. So the whole thing about, you know, um, the logo, if you remember that logo they had, it was the earth and the five wide fence. I said, that's like the concentration camp. All that was my evolution and thought process at the time. I passed that on the low. And eventually, um, he liked it. Me, Max, and my brother them was already running under the turn. You see what I'm saying? Um, Duck and Knuckles, my brother. Um, so he liked it and pretty much the rest of history we went on to do several projects like that. Me, about one or two, and then we had a great group breakup and all that that separated our ties and different things like that before the evolution of what got us to that, that plateau. Yeah, the story of my life, my brother. Uh, no, definitely. Man. <clears throat> and you know, it's, it's, it's dope because even just hearing you run it, some of the questions I was going to ask you pretty much encapsulated and, and answered uh, within that as well, which is great because a lot of people did want to know just on the genesis of the concentration camp, just the name of how it came about because yeah. it's quite an um, interesting name and title, you know. And um, I guess that's it's a good segue because they say in between the first and second um, album releases, you had the, you know, the Holocaust, they say CeeLo. He met Master P, and at this point, you know, those guys kind of got connected. And Master P had a solo track of yourself called A Fool, in which he thought it had potential to go wider on a national base. Um, so, what can you tell us about that, about some of that early connection then between C Loke and Master P, and just how you guys then started bridging in with Lonely okay. Records? Okay, well, look, for the record, I want to add this to, to, to the collection plate as well. Um. When we, we did this, we was going into the camp thing. Low, uh, being the CEO of the label, was connecting in different ways and going different areas. So somewhere he was, I want to say he meant running to mouth to feel somebody trying to moan each other. And we started to work together as, as clicks and crews. But um, I forget the story. That's what I'm trying to say. Um. Damn. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, that take my brain into a million, many, many dimensions. But, um, mm -hmm. him and, uh, they was doing their thing. We was evolving. I was saying, I want to say this for the rough. A lot of people thought it was poking fun at the Jews who, in the long night, at least in our southern section of the globe, um, 
everybody was just kind of, you know, it's a brand new thing, you know, for what it, where it is now. But nobody was looking at the conspiracy theories and so on and so forth. But what we did run into it with priority being a pretty much Jap, um, excuse me, Jewish based um, establishment and record company. Then there was questions. Who are these guys that want to call this up the concentration camp? What's the, you know, this Holocaust? They felt we was, you know, just some young black kids that would have, we just taking something we didn't know nothing about and running with it and trying to make it a cute rap group thing. I had to break down the story that I told to you on prior to now. I think they act locally, you know, at the time, hey man, what's, what's up with this? You know, it kind of threatened the deal, you know, threatened me coming out as an artist. One of the rabbis from a Jewish establishment at the time, you know, they, they put up a boycott for that rough. Before the blow out the, the JDL or the ADL or one of those guys? I want to yeah. say, I don't remember exactly who it was at the time, yeah. but something, something of that nature. And I ended up, I believe, talking to Brian Turner, somebody from Priority, and, and, and gave the definition of what it was. He said, if anything, I'm not poking fun at the Jews, separating black and Jew. If anything, it should make us combine. We come from the same similar struggle and life struggle with us. And, you know, everybody got their ancient um, civilization, um, evolution. But for black folks in America, it's a modern, it was a, you know, it's still modern day genocide. So I was going yeah. more or less and saying, you know, we still, we know struggle, we know pain, we know senseless murder uh, and pilgrimage of a people. So once that was understood, they uplift the boy kind of let us roll with it, you know, and realize, you know, it ain't just no rap group, but we just taking a cute name, trying to, you know, be hard as we can be behind a name like the Holocaust. So in relation and respect for the um, Jews, but what we're talking about nine days with Kanye and all that, I've been on that type of thing. You see what I'm saying? Just, you know, the royal bloodline and so on and so forth. That's another chapter. Of course, but, we know. What's understood don't need to be explained sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> I appreciate that. So yeah, that that's it basically. And um, mentioning Loke and um, Master P, like I say, eventually they were go off to work together with the two companies. And in the midst of that, and 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 backing you up a little bit, the original concentration camp on um, self-titled album released a single of "Fool." You know, other than that, we had we made records that was in support of CeeLo, the first couple of records on. Um, the who's gonna ride on um, the whatever record. So we were kind of um, riding side saddle in that sense of the world and just, you know, helping build him as an artist, build the label. Then by the time we were morphing to a group, we had the idea to put out a, a, um, a compilation that everybody that had, you know, could have a chance to represent who they was and where they was coming from. So that was my solo. Um, contribute to the record which, which was you know title of fool at the time eventually the hook would take off and grow bigger than the record and by the time it went from c Loc records to no limit records they had started promoting it before i knew it was promoted and the, the penitentiaries and anybody the feedback was tremendous before i even released so i just you know rolled away and compromised so i was saying pretty much the rest is history from that point uh, yeah. and just for clarity you know that song is what was you know, essentially turned into um, how you do that, which Master P went on to rework with Beats by the Pound and obviously added himself a C-Lo. It had a huge video, was featured on the Unbound It soundtrack and um, still a cult classic to this day that blew up. I believe it was even remade by Problem a couple of years ago, one of the West Coast artists. Yes, uh, one of the, um, the greatest hip hop, hip hop classics of Classics of all time, man, and still to this day. We all but 30 years late, I want to say 25, 26 years this year, you know, considering what well, really 26, maybe 27, because we were releasing in 96. Now, P would remix it and re release it in the summer of 97. And I would debut again in the world in January 1998 and hit the top of the billboard charts, hip hop, and on being three weeks after. So the evolution, the alley who to the game was phenomenal and still lives to this day to be um, still relevant, man. So that's one of the greatest, you know what I mean? Paraphrase, um, hidden songs, you know what I mean? Uh, up into the problem that would even acknowledge that I was on the record that so many people took different things from that record. So that is still a phenomenal um, thing in this, you know, way in this band. So. Yeah, no, definitely 100%, man. And um, I definitely agree with it being that type of classic. 
I'm going to switch quickly onto one fan question and then we'll get back to it. But we've got a fan question from Trio 301 TV. And he says, do you feel you get the proper due as an artist? Now, I don't know if he's speaking in relation to that song or just in general, but he says, do you feel you get the proper due as an artist? Um, half slash. It's like a 50-50 or a 60-40 thing. When you're talking corporation and industry, um, we started that way. And the, the best way I can describe to you is like the rug was pulled under from under my feet. You know what I mean? I signed a deal on the Strength of Master PSD local record um, for seven hours. You know what I mean? With Broadway Records, great right? solo artists. I did the same similar thing that I still would do when he left in WA. Um, but as we know by print, Broadway only um, put out two of those out. You see what I'm saying? But from that, I was kind of in a sense, they had a fold and the merger started to take place right in the beginning of 2000. So a lot of stuff was going on in the world, and definitely the industry. And it left me uh, kind of holding the bag. You know what I mean? Well, P had walked me in. But he was going this way. Lope had walked me in and he started all relationships straight. And everything else under the umbrella, I believe Ice Cube was leaving fraud and Mac 10 was leaving. And I was in that. High, high and off when I first come there having the number one rough. But right when I got to the point, like, okay, now I can do what I want to do, and everything kind of collapsed. Or so it left it bittersweet for me as far as having the overall access to the world and keeping in mind at the time, there wasn't no internet. You know what I mean? Everything was tangible goods. So having that, you work all your life to get to this, the top level. And all of a sudden, it comes down crashing like the twin towers on. And that's kind of what happened with me back to the underground, back to independence. And I've pretty much been that way ever since due to certain collaboration and connects along the way. I developed more industry friends and artists. So it gave me my own independent access, which I started off from selling tapes on the corner and doing my own self distribution and all that, not knowing what I was doing at the time and what title to put on it. But According to the world, everybody feel like I'm one of the most slept on rapper MCs of all time. I give it that. But according to life, it's kind of perfect order for me. You know what I'm saying? It goes with my uh, life and equilibrium. Because overall, um, worldwide notoriety, out of sight, out of mind. So, you know, I see it like that. Yeah, no, that's dope. And that's definitely a great um, philosophy and stuff as well. No not the average, but you've always displayed that you've got a different mind that's not just the average. And I think that's why a lot of fans and people have gravitated towards you and your music, even after um, the periods of obviously being pushed by bigger labels and then more underground and independent. You still had a lot of fans following you through and still want to support the work and stuff that you did. Um, just quickly backwards on the No Limit topic then, coming in to No Limit and recording that album, as you said, did you feel like you was more of an investment in a sense, or did you feel like you was actually a part of the, you know, the wider No Limit sort of roster and stuff? Because a lot of people would say, okay, you only got to release the, uh, the one album. Obviously, you did the, my own album afterwards and stuff with Priority, but with No Limit, a lot of the fans, even though it's one of their favorite albums, they feel as though you were kind of remissed on a lot of the other stuff. Um. Keep in mind, man, i tell you about this. Anything you want to know about me and the, the No Limit history, I, I, um, the word I'm looking for. I'm on, I'm on a few records. You see what I'm saying? The, um, Down South Hustle yeah. compilation and really background and, um, c Loke on the record that he had. I didn't have a song on that. The Baldy record, you know what happened? Song? Say that again, my brother. Yes, yeah, c, c Loke had that Who Am I song on the, I think he, yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, the little background vocals in the background, I want to say that's the first time I did um, the little bits and pieces, the tidbits to um, No Mercy. It's wicked when I kick it, wicked. I think I'm, you know, I hadn't listened to that record in a while, but somewhere along that time, all that was evolving. Um, the body soundtrack, I want to say Sons of Funk sampled me, and nobody else record in the whole entirety I exist on, but keeping this in mind to make this clear for the public. I never was officially a no limit soldier by contract and rough. 
But by New Orleans and Baton Rouge, and the more we came around each other, we evolved into family like that. So in the beginning, of course, it was strictly about business. I really didn't have to connect and um, back and forth with Pete, that low head. You know what I'm saying? Me being younger and developing, I hadn't had a comp- I didn't have a company at the time. So I was a, a good right hand, you know what I mean? In that sense, I kind of rolled side south too. Like I say, when you look at the record, the day they made me ball. So when everything collapsed, I had to boss up. I had to leg up to keep it going. But that's why I'm saying that. You know, on um, soundtrack um, to the street, and, you know, on soundtrack to my life. But um, that was pretty much um, how that kind of um, went down with them knowing each other and, and, and working together in that sense. Um, left me the most so focused on being that hard. You know what I mean? Being hard. So, yeah. Um, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Sorry, bro. I was just going to say, with your album, it came together quite well. A lot of people received it as one of the better albums that they feel is definitely a, a classic. They feel it's underrated in one aspect. You know, it's definitely highly, highly rated by a lot of people for its own sound and your own dynamic display and lyricism and stuff. The production yeah. had a lot of production from Happy Perez. Was it somebody? Was it? Um, did you record it yourself, like, or did you record it at like the No Limit Studios, or was it a point where you kind of recorded it yourself and then put together tracks for some of the other guys? Well, it's the thing. Um, I, me and Happy produced how you do that. I didn't take no producer credit. You feel what I'm saying? That young in the game. I wanted my homie on as a producer. That was his dream. I wanted to make it as a rap, live as a writer. Um, so, in that same sense of the word, um, Al took the credit for it going from the camp and eventually into um, No Limit and Beast by the Pound, where they enhanced. It. You see what I'm saying? So, it's several versions and evolution, uh, I mean, and, and, and evolution toward the making of that rap. Me and Happy again being the original producer and, and the rest of history. But um yeah, trying to narrow it down, man. Um he yeah. produced, he would go on and produce the balls of my word album like 85%, really the whole record. Um and we turned it in to um No Limit. And like I said, I, I was at No Limit a few times for far as recording. My last three recordings was in substitution of 14 songs I turned in. That was original, uh, originally um, the album. But due to love of compromise, you know, we substituted the ads and no limit outfit um, to, to the situation and, you know, and, and us morphing as far as the family. Um, so, you know, it was a team effort at the end of the day. Here again, shouts out to everybody before, the, you know, the original seed is part of small and growing to what we know exists today. No doubt. I mean, you. I, 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 I don't take up too much. Do you gotta get that call or, or anything, or are you all right? Um, if I um, if we call back, if, let's take us a, um a short intermission right quick, and let's pick up right here. Okay. If you if you don't mind. And, um, yeah, we'll take a break and we'll pick back up, and um, oh. then we'll just guys. Peace, family. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and check us out on bout.online.com. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook for exclusive playlists and social media for all different types of segments and content.